Welcome back to Learning with Merit. Today we're going to take a look at Python operators and how to do mathematical operations and relationship operations and things of this sort. So we're going to talk about concatenation first or how do we combine and duplicate strings. We're going to look at casting. How do we change the data type that we're working with into another data type? How do we do our arithmetic operations? So everything before algebra, that's addition, multiplication, division, these types of things. How do we deal with relational operators, which are mostly the inequalities that you may have learned about in a math class? We'll talk about some ones that maybe you haven't talked about in a math class, for example, like membership operators and identity operators. We'll look at the assignment versus the equality operator in Python. We'll look at compound assignment operators, logical operators like not, and, and, or. We'll look at compound logical expressions and De Morgan's laws. Built-in operations for that are function calls. And we will look at bitwise operators. And finally, we will take a look at the complete operator precedence in Python. We're going to expand PEMDAs. Um, that you may have learned in a math class. Concatenation is all about combining strings. We'll also take a look at how do we duplicate those strings. Um, so concatenation means to join. So we will use the plus operator to combine strings and we will use the star or asterisk operator to duplicate strings. So we look at this, we say, all right, hello and world, we want to concatenate them or join them. And so we do hello plus world. And then we have print hello world, where we also have hello plus world. And this will concatenate those two into hello world on the output. And we could also use variables. We've got A and B. We could concatenate A and B. So we'll do A plus B. If A and B store strings, then it will perform concatenation and print out. Then if we want to duplicate a string, we could use the uh, multiplication operator, which is the star or asterisk. And then we're going to do a times 3. And what this will do, we'll duplicate a three times. So we're going to do duplicated equals a times 3. And this is going to give us three a's right together. So we use the plus to combine or concatenate and the multiplication symbol to duplicate. Casting is all about converting the type of data. So sometimes in Python we find, or any programming language really, we find that we have a certain type of data that needs to be converted to another type so that we can work with it in a certain way. So let's take a look at that. We have a few function calls that we used for casting, and that's what this converting is. We call this casting. And one of them that is useful, although it doesn't do any casting, is the type call. The type is going to return the data type that you're working with. And so you might want to know what type of data a given variable is storing, and this type function call will be very useful for that. If we need convert to a string, we will use the str function. So again, str parentheses, and we'll stick whatever we need to convert inside those parentheses. Then we have the int function. This is going to convert a number or a string into an integer. So if we had a float, for example, this would convert that float into an integer. If we had hexadecimal data, we could convert that into an integer as well. All kinds of different things that we can do with that int function. Then we have the float function. It's going to convert a number or a string into a floating point number. Again, very useful for lots of different applications. So now if we have an example here, we have several different pieces of data. We have the number 5, and we have the string 10 or 10, and then we have also the number 7 here. If we print out what their data types are, so we did type A, type B, and type C, and we printed those out, we got that A is an integer, B is a string, and C is also an integer. If we convert a using the str function, so we got a, uh, str, and 5, and so now a should be a string, and we are going to convert 10 to an integer, so now b should store an integer, and c, we're going to create a float with that, so 7 is going to be converted to 7.0 as a float, so we print those out, so if we print the type of a now, we get string, 
if we print the type of b now we get an integer and if we print the type of c we now get a float and that's exactly what we would expect and allowing us to move that those different types of data around is going to be very helpful especially things like converting from a string to an integer like that when it comes to operations in Python, and really operations in general, there is an order of operations that we must follow. So here we have the general order of operations in Python. Um, I, I've done this just to make it a little simpler for you to think. We will go over a complete order of operations a little later. But in general, we can think all of our arithmetic operations are going to occur first, and they follow the PIMDAS method, or uh, what we call order of operations in math, or parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And remember, uh, multiplication, division, and addition, and subtraction, they go together. So MD goes together, AS goes together. Then we have relational operators, and they are always going to go from left to right in uh, in order and so that's going to be our things like e inequalities and stuff like that and then we have logical operators coming in third and they are going to follow this pattern right here in a o so not comes before and comes before or and that's how we need to think of our logical operators so this is the general order of operations that we will follow in python so arithmetic operators, these are all of the operators that you first learned whenever you were learning math. So these are going to be things like multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, um, exponents, and then how to use um, parentheses. So if we look at this, our first one, and we're going to do these in order of PEMDAS. So uh, of course, anything in parentheses goes first, but that's um, not something we're going to show here. We're just going to show all of the different operations. So here we have exponentiation. To do that, we're going to use two stars or two asterisks. And this is going to do a power. If we look at multiplication now, we use a single star for multiplication. We use a forward slash to divide. We use two forward slashes for floor division or what we call integer division. Now the difference between this type of division and regular division is if I do floor division, I am only going to return the number of times that the value goes into another number. And we'll look at an example in just a second. Then we have the percent symbol to do modulo. This is remainder. So it returns the remainder of a division instead of the quotient of the division. So a good example of this is if you are doing, for example, two and we're dividing that into 9, so 9 modulo 2 would be 1 because 2 goes into 9 with a remainder of 1. And we'll take a look at some more examples of that as well. And then we have addition and subtraction finally, and they're all pretty simple. The only ones that we really need to get acquainted, acquainted with is this floor division and modulo, and then what multiplication and exponentiation may look like. So let's look at some examples. So here I have 5 to the power of 2, and that's 25. Here we do have 5 times 2, that's going to be 10. 5 divided by 2 is going to give us 2.5. Then we have 5 floor division 2, or integer division 2, and what it do, that is the number 2. It truncates, meaning it cuts off after the decimal point. So it truncates or cuts off the 0.5 to the number 2. It does not round. It doesn't matter that that is a 5. It's not going to round up to 3. It's just going to cut it off. Then we have 5 modulo 2. Well, how many times will 2 go into 5? It'll go in there twice with a remainder of 1, so we get 1 back as our remainder. And then we have addition, which is pretty simple. 5 plus 2 is 7, and 5 minus 2 is 3. So that, those are our arithmetic operators. Relational operators are mostly inequalities that you may have learned from a math class, and they are used for comparisons between two different values. They will always evaluate to a Boolean, meaning a true or a false value. An inequality or a relational operation is always either true or false. There are another, no other values that will come out of a relational operation. So here we've got order of operations for that. That's going to be left to right always. It's always left to right on our... Um, 
inequality values. So if we take a look at this, we have greater than. Now the reason why this is greater than is because we're always looking at the left hand side here to determine what we're comparing. So this is the greater than symbol. Here is the less than symbol. Now the computer doesn't give us a good easy way to create greater than or equal to or less than or equal to like maybe you're used to seeing. So the way that we do that is we use the greater than symbol and an equal sign to do greater than or equal to or the less than symbol and an equal sign to do less than or equal to. If we need to compare two values as being equal, we will use two equal signs, equals equals, because remember a single equal sign is how we assign a value to a variable. Then we will use an exclamation point equals for not equal to, if we want to compare if the two values are not equal to each other. Then we have some special to Python operations. Now that does, this doesn't mean that these operations only occur in Python. It means the way that Python does them is very unique. So we have some membership operators. We have n and not n. n means that the first thing, the thing on the left, is a part of the thing on the right. And not n would mean it's not a part of the thing on the right. Then we have identity operators. Is meaning identical to meaning they typically it means they point to the same object in memory, but we'll talk about that later when we talk about objects. And then we have is not, which meaning not equal or not identical to. Let's take a look at some examples of this. So we use these for comparisons to evaluate to a Boolean. Here I've got x equals 50, y equals 45, and z equals 45. And then I've created a list that is equal to a, b, c. Then if I want to print, print x is greater than y, that's going to be true. x is less than y, that's going to be false. x is greater than or equal to z, that's going to be true. Less than or equal to z, false, equals z is going to be true. And this is y is equal to z, and we can see 45 and 45. And then we do y is not equal to x, that's also true because 45 is not equal to 50. Take a look at our membership operations. We can say print a in list 1D. Well, here we're, we're going to look at, we're going to see if a is a part of list 1D, and it is, so that's true. We're going to see if D is not in list 1D. Well, there is no D here, and so therefore that is also true. Then we can look at some identity operators. We can see if Y is Z and Y is Z, and the reason that is true is because both Y and Z point to the same value. And then we have x is not z, and that is also true because x and z do not point to the same value. So those are our relational operators. Let's check in real quickly with the assignment versus the equality operators. So we need to remember that the single equal sign is for assignment in Python, and the double equal sign is for equality or comparison in Python. And if we take a look here, we need to remember that this is always going to be on the left side of the operation. And here is a quick example. So we have a is equal to 1. This is a storing or referencing the value of 1. And then here is we are checking if a stores the value of 1. So we're checking if a is equal to the value of 1. And that will occur since a stores the value 1, we know that a is equal to 1. One. So this would be, this would be true, and this is just assignment. This is just saying a is the value 1, and this would return true. So programmers are very lazy, and sometimes we find that we are doing things repetitively, and when we're doing things repetitively, we tend to try to find a simpler way to do them or a quicker way to do them. And this is where compound assignment operators come in. So now that we know the difference between assignment and equality operators, we want some shorthand operations to perform for operation and to do some operation and assign at the same time. There's actually a really good reason for this that we will learn a little bit later as we are working through Python. But here are some examples of what we got. So we've got the plus equals. This is to add and assign at the same time. We've got minus equals. This is going to subtract and assign. 
and so on and so forth with all of our operations. So let's take a look at an example now here. We're going to do x equals 1 and we're going to show you that this thing on the left side is the same as this thing on the right side. So here we've got x equals x plus 1. So we take the current value of x, add 1 to it, and assign x to the new value. That is the same as doing x plus equals 1 over here on the right. Same thing with x equals x minus 1. It's the same thing as x minus equals 1. And as we go on, it is the same for all of the operations. They all have a compound assignment operation, and they are all the same as doing this little, this lengthier way, but this allows us to write less and does the exact same thing. So compound assignment operators. There are three logical operators that we need to know. Um, one of them is called not, one is called and, and one is called or, and they're going to follow this order of operations. It's going to be NAO. So not comes before and comes before or. So if we look at this, you can think of not as meaning the opposite. So if something is not true, for example, it would be false. And it's not false, it's true. So it gives us the opposite. And is going to, to do, deal with both, right? So and is going to be if I have this thing and that thing. If I have both, then it's true. If I don't, then it's false. And then with an or, I need at least one. So if I have this thing or that thing, as long as I have at least one, then it's true. Now let's see what that means for Python. If we take a look at this here, I've got a few variables. I've got A is true, B is false, and C is also true. And then I'm going to show you a few truth tables here. So this truth table is a not truth table. Now what this does is it's going to explain to you basically all of the different possibilities for not. So if something is not and we do and that thing evaluates to true, we have not true and that gives us false. If something evaluates to false and we have not false, then that gives us true. For and, it's a little more difficult to understand, but still pretty simple. If we have two things, one that evaluates to true and one that evaluates to true, and we say true and true, then the whole thing is true. In every other case, it will be false, however. That is because in every other case, there is at least one false. So if we have something that evalu evaluates to true and something that evaluates to false, we get false. If we have something that evaluates to false and something that evaluates to true, we get false. And then if we have both things that evaluate to false, again, we get false. So in and, we must have both. We must have true and true to get true out of an and. Otherwise, everything else is false. Then in an or truth table, if we take a look at how the or works, if we have true in at least one spot, we get true. So we got true, 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 and false. So true or true gives us true, true or false gives us true, false or true gives us true, and then false or false is the only one that gives us false because neither one of them is true. Now these three operators are extremely useful for logical operations, which is why they are called logical operators. If you will remember these truth tables, then not, and, and or are very easy to work with. When we start combining operations, things can get kind of confusing. So let's take a look at an example of a very confusing operation, especially for beginners. Here I have three variables, a, b, and c, where a is equal to 1, b is equal to 2, and c is equal to 3. And we have this long operation here where I have combined some relational operators and the and, or, and not. Now basically what's going to happen is we know that relational operations occur first, so I'm going to break this up into the relational operations and do all of those first. Then, because and comes before or, I'm going to do all of the ands first. So I would do that and, again, from left to right, and then I would do this and over here. And then finally, I would do the whole thing at the end, which is the or. So we have to evaluate the inequalities, then we would do the ands, then we would do the or at the end. 
But this can be really confusing if you don't remember all of that just off the top of your head. So one thing you could also do is use some parentheses to help you out. And I recommend this, especially for beginners here. I've put this in parentheses to help me remember that the and is going to go for, for uh, first, and that's also what I intended for it to do. If I needed the or to go first for some reason, I would need to put it in parentheses. So we need to remember the operator precedence. It does make a big difference when we are dealing with complex, um, complex Boolean expressions like the one that we are looking at right here. Okay. Now let's talk about De Morgan's laws. This is one of those things that comes up whenever we start dealing with these more complex logical operations. So it's a set of fundamental principles in logic. It shows a relationship between the logical not, the logical and, and the logical or. And let's take a look at the ones that are going to be super useful to us. So first, I have a variable a, which could be true or false, and I have a variable b, which also could be true or false. And then we're going to think like the distributive property from math class. So here we have not a and b. Well, I'm going to distribute the not, but that flips my and to an or. So what we end up with is not a or not b. These two things are equivalent. Not a and b is equal as an expression to saying not a or not b. These are equivalent expressions. You can do the same thing here. If I have not a or b, well, I got to distribute the not and my or is going to become an and. So I say not a and not b. These are equivalent expressions as well. Now don't make this error right here. A lot of people think that you can just distribute the not and they are equivalent expressions, but they are not. If you do not A and not B, it is not, in fact, equivalent to this statement right here. That would be false. And then not A or B is not equivalent to not A or not B. That is also a false statement. So remember, these are De Morgan's laws up here. These are correct. This is a common error that you will make and is incorrect. Now we're going to take a look at some built-in operation function calls, and this won't this won't be an in-depth analysis of any of these functions, but I just want you to know that they what they are and in general kind of what they do, and later we may talk more about them. So here we have the ABS function call. This is for returning the absolute value of a number. So if we say ABS negative 10, we get the number 10 back. And then here we have max. This is going to take in any iterable value or a list of comma separated values like this. And it's going to return the largest item in that iterable, which could be like a list, for example, something that we can loop through or get values from in an order, right? And what we're going to do is we take a look at this and we say, okay, 10 is our largest value and that's what max is going to return. So it's going to give us that largest value. And then we have min, which is just the opposite of max. It's going to return our smallest value. Then we have sum. This is really great if you want to sum up a list of values or any iterable with numbers in it, for example. So this would add up 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and return 15 to us. A very simple little function there. Then we have the pow function. This is for doing powers. Now you may notice that we also have the exponentiation uh, operator, which is star star or asterisk asterisk. We could also use pow for this and there are some other things that you can do with pow as well that you can't necessarily do with the exponentiation operator. Then we have round and round is very useful because Python doesn't automatically round for you. So here we have the round function call and we're passing two arguments to it, 3.14159 and we want to round it to two digits. So that is the number of digits we want to round it to and that should give us 3.14 back. Then we have the div mod, and what this does is it returns a tuple containing the quotient and the remainder of a division. So this can be um, actually very useful. So if we have 10 and 3 here, and we did 10 divided by 3, that would give us 3 with a remainder of 1, and that is the tuple or unchangeable list that it would uh, give back to us. And we could use that for all kinds of things. Then we have this complex function call, which technically what this is, is it's a constructor. You'll notice it's a different color, by the way. 
This is technically a constructor for building a complex number. So here we have um, complex one and two, and we give it the real part and the imaginary part, and it builds the complex number for us that we could use later. Remember that the imaginary unit is the square root of negative one, and that comes from, uh, or sorry, is represented by j here. Now we have a, another little round function here. So this is gonna round to the nearest integer. So instead of using round like we did here to round to a specific number of digits, we could just round and it will round to the nearest integer without passing in that second value. Then we have all. What all does is it returns true if all the elements in a particular iterable are true. So that means an iterable, for example, like a list, something that I can go through and have values returned to me is an iterable. And in this case, it should return true if all of these values are true, but they are not because we have a single false value. Then we have any. This one is like all, but the difference is, is if any of them are true, it returns true. So since we have at least one true value in our iterable here, it returns true. Now we're going to look at a little more advanced topic in Python, which is bitwise operations. So we're going to be dealing with bits here, and it's going to be a little bit different than our logical operators that we've dealt with before. So let's get right into it. Here we have the bitwise operations. They're going to work on individual bits within the data. And then the order of operations for our bitwise operators is not, then the shifts, that's left and right shifts. Then we're going to do and, XOR, and or, or in X, or in S A X O, or in Saxo, however you want to say it. So if we look at this, we have our bitwise not, which is just this little tilde character, and it means opposite, of course. We have our bitwise shift left, which is two left angle brackets, or our bitwise shift right, which is two right angle brackets. Then we have the bitwise and, which uses an ampersand, and of course that is both. Then we have a bitwise XOR which uses the circumflex character or caret symbol, whichever you call it, and it means only one. This is going to be a little bit of a new one. And then we have the bitwise or, which uses a vertical bar or pipe character, depending on what you call it. And then it says at least one. So we should remember these from our logical not, and, and or. They're going to be very similar, but the difference here is we're operating logically on bits instead of logically on true or false values. So let's take a look at that. So our binary data representation, this is important for us to understand because um, one of the most confusing things about bitwise operators is the result of a bitwise operation, what you get out. And so that can be very difficult to understand. So first we need to talk about two's complement notation. So when we represent integers, they're going to use as many bits as they need in memory. And this is true for Python. It's not true for every language, but it's true for Python. They're only going to use as many bits as they need. So in our two's complement represent, representation, or in order to have positive and negative values, positive in, uh, integers are going to have a leading zero bit. So they will have leading zeros to indicate that they're positive. And negative integers will have a leading one uh, bit to indicate that they are negative. So let's take a look at an example of this. Here we have positive integers. And in Python, it's conceptually infinite leading zeros. We couldn't actually have infinite leading zeros because that would take up all of the memory of the computer and then we couldn't literally do anything except store that one single value and even that wouldn't be big enough for infinite. So <clears throat> one of the ways that we can denote this is with these leading uh, ellipses here so that you can, you can understand it's meant to be conceptually infinite leading zeros. So if we have the number one and it is the positive number one, then it will be zero one for positive. And of course, we're thinking infinitely leading zeros there. If we have a negative one, the difference here is that we end up with just a one. And that is because the leading one here also counts as a value. So instead of doing zero one, like we did for positive, we just say one. And that indicates to the computer, because conceptually infinitely leading ones, this is a negative one. So the difference here is you can think of zero one here as the positive number one and the number one here in binary, just one, as negative one. This is going to help us understand our first bitwise operations. So in bits, true is equal to one and false is equal to zero in Python. 
So if we take a look at this, we've got the bitwise not, and we're going to use that little tilde symbol, and it's going to flip all of the bits in a binary number. So it's going to change each zero to a one and each one to a zero. So let's take a look at this. Here I have print, I'm going to print out the binary of, the, of x. So the binary for x is 0b to indicate binary 1, 1. Right? Now that's what it's going to print out, but what it actually is stored in memory is infinitely leading zeros 1, 1. Then the same thing, here we have print and we're going to do the binary of not x. So what this does is because it has a leading zero, it flips that leading zero to a one and those ones to zeros. So what you get out of this, what you actually get out of this is negative four because this is gonna be ones, twos, and then fours place. And because we have infinitely leading ones now, it's negative four. So when you do a, a bitwise not operation on the value three, you get negative four out because it flips those leading, those leading zeros to a one and those last two ones to a zero, and you end up with one zero zero, which is negative four in two's complement notation. Bitwise not, it will really throw you off if you don't understand the concept of the infinitely leading zeros to create signed integers. I recommend you play around with it and see if you can predict what those different values will be. So let's look at our bitwise shifts now. We have left shift and we have right shift. And this is going to move all the bits of a number by a specified number of positions. So let's look at this. So if we're going to left shift, this is equivalent, by the way, to doing x. So whatever our x value is, so our number, times 2 to the power of whatever the shift amount is. And this effectively does the same thing. But we're going to look at this more conceptually without doing um, any exponentiation here. So if we have the value 1, we have 0b1, that's our binary in Python. And then if I print the x shift of this, well, the value that I get out is 8. So what's happened is I've moved this three values to the left. So we started here, and we did 1, 2, 3, and now we're at 1, 0, 0, 0, and that gives us the number 8. Here we can look at uh, what this actually looks like. So here if I have 0B0001, and then I shift it three spots, well here's the zero spot, that's one, two, three, that moves me to this spot, and now I have one, zero, 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 which is the value eight. Then we have the right shift operation here. Right is gonna do the same thing, but a little bit differently. So here I have the value 255 in binary, which is one with um, seven zeros behind it. And then I want to shift X, which is storing 255, to the right seven values, and that gives me zero B1, so the number one. So let's take a look at how that works. So if I have one with seven zeros behind it, and I'm gonna move that one seven spots to the right, you'll see that I've counted off here, and my seventh spot is right here. So now we just have leading zeros, so zero B1, and we end up with the decimal number one and the binary number one. If we're going to do a bitwise AND, this is going to take two numbers and perform a logical AND operation on them. The AND is actually probably really simple. The shifts and the NOT can be really confusing, but the AND and the OR are not terribly confusing. So let's look at this. The resultant bit, meaning the bit that we get out of this AND operation, is one if both bits are one. So Think of it like this. I have two numbers here, and if I perform a AND on them, here's what it looks like. So 12 and 10, here is their binary. Then if I do 1 and 1, well, that results in a 1. 1 and 0 results in a 0. 0 and 1 results in a 0. And 0 and 0 results in a 0. And you may have noticed I picked those numbers on purpose so that we would get those um, different groupings. So we end up with the number 8 when we do a bitwise AND on X and Y, or 12 and 10 here. Now if we do an OR with the little, or sorry, an XOR. Now if we do an XOR, this is only one. The only time an XOR is true is if only one thing is true. So if I must have a one and a zero in the locations in order to get this to be true. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So resultant bit is one if only one bit is one. So here if I do the same numbers, 12 and 10, 
what we end up with is 1 and 1. Well, both of them are 1s, so we get 0. The next one we get 1 and 0. And because only one of them is 1, we get a 1. And then we have 0 and 1. And because only one of them is a 1, we get 1 again. And then the last one we have 0 uh, and 0, which is going to give us a 0. So when we perform an XOR on these bits, only the times in which only one of the values is a 1 do we get a 1 out. And this is called an exclusive OR operation and is actually very useful, um, believe it or not, because there's lots of times in which we only want one thing to be true but not both. Then we have the bitwise OR. So this is at least one. So at least one of the values has to be true for the end value to be true, or at least one of the values has to be a 1 for the resultant bit to be a 1. So let's take a look at this. Here we got 12 and 10 again, and we're going to perform the bitwise x or, or sorry, bitwise or on that. We have 1 and 1, which results in 1. We have 1 and 0, which also results in a 1. We have 0 and 1, which also results in a 1. And then finally, the only time in which we result the 0 is both are 0, and so we get a 0 out, and we end up with the number 14 when we print. So the bitwise operations can be kind of confusing. But I will tell you, they make a, a, a lot of sense um, once you start messing around with them. And probably the not operation is going to be the most confusing, in my opinion, because you have to understand how that data is stored in memory. Now let's look at a couple of truth tables. So truth tables are going to show how these large logical operators are evaluated. So what bitwise operations are doing is they are actually applying the um, logical operations on the bits. So instead of doing true and false, for example, we're doing 1 and 0. So not 1 is 0, and not 0 is 1. And then if we come down here and we look at the truth table for this, we do 1 and 1, we get 1. We do 1 and 0, we get 0. 0 and 1 is 0 and 0 and 0 is 0. And maybe you remember this from when you looked at the logical operators. It's basically the same. We've just replaced true with ones and false with zeros. Here in the XOR, if we have both bits as a 1, we get a 0. If we have both bits as a 0, we get a 0. If we have one bit as a 1 and one bit as a 0, we get a 1 out. And then our OR, if we have at least one bit as a 1, we get a 1, and the only time we're going to get a 0 is this last case where we have two zeros. So that's bitwise operations in a nutshell, and I encourage you to try some of these out and see if you can predict the values because they can be kind of confusing, but hopefully this cleared them up for you. Lastly, we're going to look at the complete operator precedence in Python, and this is just a great table for you to take a look at. Right here, we have parentheses first, anything in parentheses goes first, then exponentiation comes next, then unary uh, plus unary minus. These are going to be things where we do, um, we add a value or um, do a bitwise not, for example. And then we have our multiplication division, floor division, and modulus. They all go together because there are multiplication division values. Then we had addition and subtraction. Then our bitwise shifts and bitwise operators come next. Then our comparisons. Then our identities. Then our memberships. And then finally, last, are our logical operations that we do there. So this is a great little table in case you are ever confused what is going to come before what whenever you're doing a particular operation in.